Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm so sorry that I'm late. I thought we were starting at seven today. So I, I was completely, uh, it slipped my mind that we was at uh, starting at 6.30. I had to rush here because I was coming here from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, I just actually uh, proposed to my girlfriend this last uh, Monday. So I had went up there to go see her. But I'm very excited to be here with you all to uh, have this Bible study. Uh, this is something that the Lord put on my heart because I believe as Christians and as believers, we should always know the, uh, what the sanctuary is. There is such an important message in the sanctuary. And so before we get started, I would like for us to bow our heads and close our eyes. And I won't take too much time. I'll try to move as quick as possible because I'm late. All right, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father in heaven, we ask for your Holy Spirit to come with uh, join us today. Speak to us, Heavenly Father, through the power of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the sanctuary, the first point I want to make up, make out is this. The purpose of the sanctuary. When I first start studying about the sanctuary, I, I asked myself, Lord, what, is, well actually I asked the Lord, but I was talking to myself. I said, Lord, what is the purpose of the sanctuary? And so he took me to this verse right here. Exodus 25, 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So the sanctuary was obviously a place that God instructed them to build out in the desert when the children of Israel were traveling. And the whole purpose of the sanctuary was he wanted to dwell among them. But it goes far beyond just the children of Israel. It wasn't just the children of Israel that God wanted to dwell among. We're going to learn about that a little bit later. So here goes the, uh, a brief description of the sanctuary. This is a little diagram right here. It says, uh, the original sanctuary was an allegiant temp type structure, 15 feet by 45 feet based on an 18 inch cubit in which the presence of God dwelt and special services were conducted. The walls were made of upright wooden boards set in silver sockets and overlaid with gold. The roof was made of four coverings, linen, go hair, ram skin, and badger skin. And it had two rooms the holy place and the most holy place. A thick heavy veil or curtain separated the rooms. The courtyard, the area around the sanctuary, as you see here, was 75 feet by 100 feet. It was fenced with fine linen cloth supported by 60 pillars of brass. So the house, this is the whole diagram of the sanctuary. This right here, it had three compartments. It had the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. Got that? Three. Outer court, holy place, most holy place. And each place had furniture in them that represent something. So the whole point of this sanctuary right here that God told him to build, this wasn't just, a, a, just any kind of design. God just didn't make, tell them to build a sanctuary just for show so they can all look good. And, and No, there was a purpose. There was a reason why God told them to build a sanctuary because God was going to send them a message not just for them, but a message all the way even to our time through this sanctuary. Let's see what, let's see what Psalm 77, 13. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. What does that say? Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? God's way, the plan of salvation is revealed in the earthly sanctuary. See, when we fell, when we fell, from when we fell into sin, God already had a plan. And through this sanctuary, God was going to, it was, he was literally revealing to humans, to us, what his plan was. What is the plan of salvation? That is the whole purpose of the sanctuary. The whole purpose of the sanctuary is to reveal to us what the plan of salvation is. Let's start with the furniture. Let's start with the courtyard. The first thing that was in the courtyard was the altar of burnt offerings, which were animals were, which were animals were sacrificed. It was located just inside its entrance. This altar represented the cross of Christ. The animal represented Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice. You read in Revelation where he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Or when John saw Jesus, he said, behold, the Lamb of God that take away the sin of the world. They didn't just sacrifice animals just to be sacrificing them and have a good time. Like, yeah, we like the rest of the, the people around them. There was a reason why they sacrificed the lamb. And the lamb represented Jesus Christ. And this is a little bit, this is what it looked like. The first part right there. Second one, the labor. 
Located between the altar and the entrance to the sanctuary was a large wash basin made of brass. Here, priests washed their hands and feet before offering a sacrifice or entering the sanctuary. The water represents cleansing from sin and the new birth. In other words, it represents baptism. The labor represents baptism. Yes. Which one? Oh, yes. So you have the uh, burnt offering right here. This is where they made the sacrifice. This is where they washed their hands. Now, in my mind, I always kind of wonder, why, why, why is this <laughs> not first? But the way the Bible describes it is that this was in between this and this. So even before they uh, did the burnt uh, offering, they would have to wash their hands. But the reason why it was made in this setting was because when you accept the cross, you, be, you get baptized. That is why the setting is that way. It's literally like steps, uh, steps to Christ, you might say. That's why I got that at the beginning. And then you got the holy place, which is right here. And the table of shoe bread, you can tell this diagram. Uh, the veil, which is right here. The golden lamps, uh, lampstand, which is right here, which had the seven, seven candlesticks, if you want to look at that. And then you have the altar of incense in the middle. And then the next place, you had the last place, which was the holies of holies. This place was the Ark of the Covenant. We're going to talk a little about that later. So to explain that, this is how it, this is how it looked. But the way it looked, what we're going to learn about that in the future is that it was made this way so we can understand our walk with our, because you know, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, that was definitely, this is just, they just left it open so we can see what it looked like in the inside. So there definitely was a roof over it. This whole thing was covered. So obviously you didn't walk over and you could just jump up and say, oh, yeah, I, I see over it. Now you can't, you can't, this, this picture is just a diagram so we can look at the inside. No, <laughs> I'm not making sure for people, not making sure. But yeah, that's, that's all this is. There, there's definitely a roof and a uh, whole thing. And then later on in the, in the Bible, this went from the tent thing to inside the temple. So, uh, but this is just so we can see what it looked like on the inside. So for those are watching, for those participating, they let the, so there don't be no confusion, no confusion. All right. Now, of course, uh, like you were saying a little bit here, but they just opened it up so we can just see the inside of what it looks like. So don't go home and say, oh yeah, it was open. Uh, Cause no, it wasn't, it wasn't open. <laughs> All right. So next we have, oh yeah, we just talked about that. The water represents cleansing from sin and new birth. So obviously, when you accept the cross, when you accept the power of Christ, when you accept who he is, the very next step is to get baptized. That's why it's in that order. And that's what, you know, we do as Christians. When God reveals himself to us, we understand the importance of the cross. We understand what God did in our lives. When we understand the true power of how God came down for the sake of man as a gift. He didn't have to do it, but he did it because he loved us and he wants to save us. So when we do that, we, we confess our sins, right? We confess our sins at the cross. We say, Lord, I am a sinner. We are all sinners. We say, Lord, I am a sinner. There is nothing. I am nothing without you is what the Bible says. And then we get, we get baptized, meaning newness of life. That means we become new creatures in Christ Jesus. But it gets so much deeper. Tonight is not the night, but later on. But this right now, we're just running through the furniture, saying what they represent. But next time, I promise you, I'll be on time. We're going to go way deeper. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> All right, let's look at the holy place. The holy place had the table shoe wear, which you saw in the diagram, was on this side. Represented Jesus as well. You know why? Because the Bible says, Jesus said he was the living bread. He was the living bread. You see what this is, you see where this is going? And, uh, you know, it's interesting because uh, the Bible talks about bread and the word of God. Don't that, you know, don't the Bible talk about the two representing each other? So even in our walk, we learn to read the Bible. The Bible literally talks about Jesus, the whole thing. From Genesis to Revelation, it talks about Jesus Christ. And I, I, I don't know, we're living in a time now where some people don't, they think just the New Testament talks about Jesus. But Jesus was revealed all the way since the beginning in the Old Testament. But when you study scripture with scripture, that's how we understand that. But it's powerful. It's pretty awesome. But let's keep going because I don't want to waste your time. Okay. 
Next thing, the seven branch candlestick also represents Jesus. The light of the world, the oil represents the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And you know what Jesus also said? He said, let your light shine in me. So when you first get, you know, you come to the cross, you baptize, represent a newness of life. You begin to study God's word. His word begins to change us. And then when we study God's word, through the power of working of the Holy Spirit, revealing it to us, we learn that Jesus' light shines in us. Jesus' light begins to be seen in us everywhere we go. You know, there are places where you go where people, you don't even have to do anything, honestly. You could just be a regular good person. You could just be walking around or something. And then somebody will look at you and say, there's something different about you. There is something, I don't know how many times I have experienced that, where people will say, you know, you just, there's something different about you. Like the way you conduct yourself, the way you act, the way you talk, that's the light of Christ that they're sending us. And it's him shining through us. So he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. That is why when we live, we don't live for ourselves anymore. We live for Christ. Christ begins to change our lifestyle. That is just, and it's a gift. It's nothing we can do within ourselves. We can't just wake up and be like, all right, today I'm going to do right. And then all of a sudden you just do everything right. It doesn't work like that. We're going to make mistakes, but God teaches us, right? We take steps towards him. It's not something we can just accomplish just in a blink of an eye. It's impossible. But that is what that represents. The red oil represents the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about that even more in the future. I'm just trying to get us to understand right now just what was inside the sanctuary. But next time, I promise you, we'll break this down even more. The last thing that was in the holy place was the altar of incense, which represents the prayers of God's people. The way we communicate with God is through prayer. And God has given us the opportunity to be connected to our Heavenly Father again. And literally, as you guys see so far, the entire sanctuary is about Jesus. The entire sanctuary. This is all the plan of salvation. When we pray in the name of Jesus, when we pray through Jesus, God hears us. We don't have Jesus, we don't have nothing. We can't just pray and say, Lord, you know, and if we don't pray, if we don't live or pray through Jesus, we got nothing. We first have to go back to that first step, accepting him at the, at the cross before we can go anywhere else, before we can even walk to the next place. We, we have to first come to the cross. That is a first step in the plan of salvation. Last, let's see here, the most holy place. Oh, wow. Let's look at what's in there. The Ark of the Covenant, the only piece of furniture in the most holy place was a chest. I don't know how to pronounce that, but I'll try. Asia wood, overlaid with gold, placed on the top. Uh, it's placed on the top. The chest were two angels made of solid gold. Between these two angels was the mercy seat where the presence of God dwelt. This symbolized God's throne in heaven, which is likewise located between two angels. Those are the verses say. So the Ark of the Covenant literally is where God came down and, and just and set. And then obviously we're going to talk about that later on too, because there was a time, uh, there was different time periods of when they went through the whole sanctuary ceremony where God would have met them. And only certain people could even enter the sanctuary at that time because of the power of God. This had to be so organized because if you just walk as sinners, if you just walked into the presence of God thinking you're going to be okay, you'll fall down dead. Because we're sinners, we're not worthy to stand before the presence of the Holy God. That's why they had to go through the phase of the sanctuary. And you had the priests at those days, they would intercede for the behalf of people. We're going to talk about that later too, because that's also talking about Jesus Christ, about the, the character and the actions that the priests did. Anything that they did, they did it because they were representing Jesus Christ. Literally, this whole thing is about Jesus Christ. And they, they lost track of that. At some point, you read throughout the Bible, at some point throughout history, the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, they all lost sight of that. But it's no longer about the Messiah, no longer about Jesus. It's more about themselves. But they began to think that they were the ones that were supposed to intercede on the behalf of man for salvation. But well, that's not the case. The only person who can intercede on the behalf of salvation for man is Jesus Christ. And that's why this whole thing just points to him. And we're going to look at that picture right there. Isn't that awesome? Now, I'm pretty sure it was more awesomer than that. Like, this is just a, man, this, this is just a drawing right here. But I'm pretty sure it was more awesomer than that. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you couldn't even look at them. Because, I mean, you know, there were so many people in the Bible where they stood before the presence of God. They had to just go flat down because they just were not worthy. But let's go back. And then what was inside the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments, which God wrote on tables of stone, which his people will always obey, which were inside the Ark. But the mercy seat was above them, which signifies that as long as God's people confess and forsake sin, mercy will be extended to them through the blood that was sprinkled on the mercy seat by the priest. 
The blood of the animal represented Jesus' blood that would be shed to bring us forgiveness of sins. So at, that's what I was telling you guys about earlier. At a certain part throughout history, I think they did like once a year, where the priests would gather all the blood and they would sprinkle it on the mercy seat and things like that. That was just a sign representing uh, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus, obviously, they said the Bible that God sat on the throne, and uh, they call it the mercy seat because God said, my mercy is everlasting. And God is so merciful that anytime we confess and, for, and repent, he will forgive our sins. He promises he will hear us and forgive us. And he won't even mention the sins anymore. You read the book of Ezekiel, God said, I won't mention nothing you've done anymore. None of the evil that you've done. If we repent and confess our sins, he won't even mention it. It, was like, it would be like we never committed it. It would be like we never committed a sin. That's what the Bible teaches us. But if we do not confess our sins or come to Christ, he won't mention none of the good things we've done because those things don't matter. Because then we'll just boast about those things. Say, oh, I did this, oh, I did this, oh, I did that. And God won't get the glory. I don't want to be on that part of the group. That's the side you don't want to be on. It's a side where God only remembers the sins and not the good. Because reality, there's no good thing in us. So is it really good? What was the reason behind the so-called good things that we've done? Was it to glorify ourselves or was it to glorify God? That's why we need a Savior. So we know for certain that it was to glorify him, not ourselves. And then, of course, under there was the Ten Commandments, the law that we broke. The law that we keep breaking, God's mercy is there to help us keep those commandments. That's why he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But we can't do it on our own. We can't. And literally, that is the throne of God right there. Thank you, most holy place. Uh, obviously, this is a picture of the Ten Commandments. God wrote the Ten Commandments himself with his own finger and gave it to the children of Israel. But it wasn't just for the children of Israel like people think. It was for all of us, for everyone. The children of Israel were just supposed to let their light shine to everybody else. But they didn't do that. Maybe through different times they did, a few people. But after a while, they just lost sight of it. They became prejudiced. They became all kinds of things. They thought because they were the chosen people at one point that everything that God was doing was just for them and them alone. But if you really study the Bible, it was not just for Israelites. God was making, letting them be a light for the Gentiles as well. And there are so many points in the Bible about that, so many. I just didn't have time to put it all in there because, you know, it's just we could go on for hours talking about that. I'm so serious. We could definitely go on for hours talking about that because nowadays there are even people who do it today. We are, if we're not careful, there are certain scriptures that we might apply that just only fits in one area, but reality, it was a lesson for all eternity. And of course, uh, these were the reference pages of the, of course, I thank all the, uh, the Sabbath School, Amazing Facts, the Truth Discovery, everything. Uh, because uh, this is where I get my reference from when it comes to Bible study, uh, because uh, when I went through them myself, it was very clear to me, very easy, very easy. So I said, all right, thank you guys for giving us the resources <laughs> so we can share the same information with everybody else. But as you can see, it's over. It was very quick. Today, that's all I wanted to do. I want us to go through just what was inside and the representation of it. But it actually goes even deeper than that. But I wanted us to understand that the sanctuary is about Jesus Christ. The entire Bible is about Jesus Christ. Everything, everything that the Bible speaks on, everything is pointing us to Jesus Christ, and we need him. And through the sanctuary, he gives us the plan of salvation, of giving man and all of us a chance, you and I, to come home. Because the, the, way, the, earth, the, the way this earth is right now, see, this is why the plan of salvation is so important. Because the way that the earth is right now, this is not our home. It's not supposed to be like this. The earth is not supposed to be like this. The earth was a paradise at one point. It was a place of peace, joy, love. You can feel it in the atmosphere, the Garden of Eden. It was supposed to be a place where we're supposed to be, we're supposed to live forever. And God, and then when, then when we failed, God was so merciful. He said, okay, I have a plan. I'm going to give each and every one of you, even me, a chance to come home. Back to the paradise of God back to the way things were supposed to be. He's given us a chance to have such experience that we have never experienced in our life. He said, I go and prepare a place for you. We can't even imagine the things that God has planned for us. He says he's going to make a new heaven, a new earth, and he wants us all to be there. He said he's going to do it all over again, everything. And it's going to be better than last time. You know why it's going to be better than last time? Because he says sin will never rise again. It will never rise again. And I'm so grateful to know that. 
And obviously the enemy's working so hard to get us distracted with the cares of this world. And we get so caught up in this world. When God is telling us, he said, listen, this world is going to be destroyed. It's going down. I have a, I'm giving you all a chance to come home. And it's just like, it's so awesome. The mercy of God, because Jesus is literally standing there knocking at the door of our hearts, he says. And all we have to do is just let him in. That's all we got to do. And he said, I'll take care of the rest. God is just so merciful. That's why when I see all this stuff around, people tell me, oh, Matt, live your best life. Oh, Matt, you're young. You don't need to worry about that. You need to worry about that. I, you know what I, you know, you know, know my response? I said, I live my best life when Jesus come back. Because as long as I'm on this earth, I will never have a best life. I will never have a best life. I might be able to experience some good things here and there, but my best life will come when Jesus returns. And that is the blessed hope of the Christian church is that Jesus says, I'm going to come and I'm taking you all home with me. Anyone who trusts in me, anyone who believes in me, anyone who accepts this plan of salvation, I'm bringing you home with me forever. And that is the power of the gospel. So awesome. And we're going to get more deeper into that. But I'm so happy we was able to do it in just a little time. I don't want to hold you guys up so long. I'm sorry once again. Keep you guys waiting. You know, I just, I just lost food with track of everything. But I promise you, I'll be right on time next week. And, I, and uh, there's, uh, obviously, I'm going to be picking some people up as well who want to be part. So I, I think uh, for people who wasn't here, I don't know if we should uh, um, maybe try. I'll probably try to reach out to them to go over this. So that way, there won't be no confusion when they come back. Uh, oh, oh, yes. And, uh, okay. OK, OK, OK. You've been recording. That sounds good. All right, Let me good. say something too. I, I I should have introduced this guy. So oh, guys, <laughs> the, the, his name is Matthew Fulgram, yes. and we just we just uh, got approval from our conference to hire him to help us do some Bible studies and so forth. And so he's going to be doing a little bit of work with us. And amen, amen. so you know we appreciate it very much. <laughs> You're welcome. And, and You're welcome. Let me point out a couple other things that you were saying too. That's really cool. If you guys notice, when he was talking about the Ark of the Covenant, and he was talking about the Ten Commandments being in the inside of the Ark of the Covenant, um, that Ark of the Covenant is still here on this earth, and it will be discovered before the end of time happens. Now, that's for another study, but what I wanted to tell you was that there was a reason why the Ten Commandments were put in there, because they were not done away with. And, you know, when John the Revelator saw the vision of heaven and yes. he saw what was going to happen in heaven, um, he also saw the Ark of the Covenant. And inside of the Ark of the Covenant in heaven is what? The Ten Commandments. Exactly. And that just shows that we will live by those. Um, there are denominations in the Christian church that say we're under grace now. We don't have to live by the Ten Commandments. But really think about the silliness of that which mm -hmm. commandment can you get rid of that would not harm us exactly none and so god is he embodies the ten commandments and he lives by them right right because that is him and so yeah they, it's just there's just too many things that just prove otherwise so i just wanted just to point that out and here's another little piece of interesting things you know when God came and he met with Moses on the, on the mount, um, on the mountain, it says in the Bible, and you may have never caught this before, and it's kind of worth going back and, and reading in it, um, it talks about that there was some pavement that was laid down, and that pavement was blue sapphire. Mm. And it talks about how, how the, it's blue, right? And then it's interesting because, you know, in our concept, when we talk about the Ten Commandments, what is it that we always see these rough, jagged rocks you know that aren't very pretty you know and so forth but you know that rocks can be really beautiful right if they're polished right and so forth and his pavement that his throne was on that he was sitting on while he was on this earth was blue sapphire and it says in one place it says that god gave him some of that stone for the ten commandments and so it's it it it's it's alludes to the fact that the Ten Commandments were probably blue sapphire. So they're not the rough, <laughs> jagged rocks that we would see in movies today. Yeah, like, uh, like Hollywood uh, presents, yeah. But you made a, uh, and that's one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning was 
that's something we're also going to talk about is that literally the sanctuary uh, that you guys all saw is literally a, a diagram of heaven. It's literally a diagram of heaven. So that's something we're going to talk about. The sanctuary you just saw is literally a diagram of heaven. And that's what he was mentioning uh, earlier. This is so this definitely is it's going to get much more awesome, I promise you. But God was literally showing us the plan of salvation and what exactly what he's going to do. So we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about those things. We're going to talk about Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about what's he doing in heaven right now. We're going to talk about the ticket. We're going to talk about a lot of these things. We're going to try to do it in a way where it's very easy to understand things like that. But it's very true what uh, uh, Calvin said is that the Ten Commandments was not done away with. It was never done away with. And you do have a lot of people who believe that because we're saved, they say because we're saved under grace. But there's just a lot more verses that we have to compare Scripture and Scripture with that would tell us that we are not just saved by, we are saved by grace alone. But it does not mean that the commandments are, 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 are nothing, as people believe. Paul had made that very clear. He even says somewhere, I believe it was in Romans, where he said, do we do away with the law because we're saved under grace? He said, God forbid, we establish the law. So he even tells you, this, the law does not go away. <laughs> it does not go away. So it's just so much we got to talk about on that part. But the sanctuary is such a powerful, powerful message. And I believe from, my, from the deepest part of my heart, every Christian believer needs to know the sanctuary. Because literally, like the psalm says, thy way is in the sanctuary. The plan of salvation is literally in the sanctuary. If you understand the sanctuary, it just literally opens our understanding to everything else in the Bible. So I just want us to keep that in mind. Uh, thank you again for having me. I'm so grateful that I'm going to be working with you all and working with Northwood Southern Adventist Church. Uh, it's been, I, I've been anxious. I've been pushing this thing for a long time. I've been like, when y'all going to get me over there? When y'all going to get me involved in something? Finally happened. So I will be definitely doing everything I can because my service to God. I really love the Lord so much. I, I like to tell people I'm basically like a student pastor. I'm learning like how to do pastoral ministry kind of thing. I also am a guest student at Andrews University. Uh, taking classes and religion classes, all kinds of stuff. It, it, my brain really hurts bad. <laughs> okay, my brain really hurts. It's just so much in the Bible to learn. And it, I be open, like when I start to learn stuff, I, I look at it, I say, wow. Like when you really study the Bible and you, just, and you got help, and you got people to help teach it, just the stuff that be in there blows my mind half the time because you just never look at it in the ways that it, it's explained. But it's just the Bible is just really an awesome book, and it changed my life. That's why I'm a Christian today, because God had changed my life through his word. So I know I might be young, and you know, some of you all, oh, man, yeah. no, trust me. I have had so many amazing encounters with the Lord, and it's very powerful. One day I may be able to share some of my testimonies with you. Uh, but for right now, uh, just going to do everything I can to serve God, be good to his people, be good to his church. And that's just my goal, making it to heaven. That is my ultimate number one goal, because I'm, I'm tired of this earth tired of this earth. So with that being said, 730, let's all bow our heads and close our eyes for a word of prayer. And again, thank you all for watching online as well, and thank you all for being patient. <laughs> Father God in heaven, we are so grateful that we was able to come together as a family and study your holy word. It is important that we learn to study because in your word there is light, and your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so we thank you, Heavenly Father, for the privilege that we are able to study and learn of you. And as we continue to study moving forward, we just invite the Holy Spirit to come and just guide us in our experience, and teaching us your ways, teach us who you are, and so we can learn more about you so that your light can shine bright in us everywhere we go. So we can draw closer and closer to you every single day. You say you let them make a sanctuary so you may dwell. You want to dwell among us. You want to live in us. You want to commune with us. You want to speak with us. You want us, Heavenly Father, to make it to heaven and to be with you once again. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace towards all humanity. And we're just praying, Lord, that as in our daily lives, continue to work such marvelous works in our lives, we can have a testimony to share with someone else. And the light that you give us to share with somebody else, that they be drawn to thee. And let your will be done. We'll be careful to give you praise and our glory to take those uh, that are here as we go home, as we uh, drive, and throughout the rest of the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.